the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God. Okay, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. It's a blessing having our visitors here today, Faith and Jeffrey. We're so thankful that you joined us and that you stopped. So, and of course, our regulars, and then our regulars that are vacationing, that may watch this, I don't know, that may be too long, you might get a little boring, you know, but, uh, and then to our subscribers, we just welcome you, Shabbat Shalom, the whole, there's more subscribers than there are people in our little congregation here, but we're thankful for you, we appreciate you signing up and, and we pray that the messages have been a blessing and have added substance and understanding to your life and has helped you to navigate just the troubles we all face, the challenges we all face. So the Parsha for today is Vayet Hanan, I Pleaded. And we are in Devarim, Devarim 3.23 to 7.11. And as I prepared for this Parsha, I, I looked at a lot of material and I said, Lord, I, I wasn't really getting a sense of anything particular. And, and the Spirit of the Lord said to me, you don't have to, it's all there. He said, what I want to say is basically right there. I've said it. You just need to read it. And make some comments along the way. So, I'm going to begin. It begins with, then I pleaded with Adonai. Moshe pleaded with Adonai. You, you have, he finally, after 40 years, getting ready to enter into the wilderness, into the uh, Jericho, cross over the Jordan, he said, you have begun to reveal your greatness to your servant, and your strong hand for what other God is there in heaven or on earth that can do the works and mighty deeds that you do. And he uses that as a kind of a, a, a prelude into perhaps softening the heart of God to let him go into the promised land. And we all know why he couldn't go into the promised land because he didn't obey God. At the springs of Meribah, God told him to speak to the rock and his anger got the best of him because the people were, 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 were rebellious. They were kvetching. They were complaining and, and quarreling and giving him an issue. And, and so he struck the rock. And God said, you dishonored me. I had something for the people to see by you speaking to the rock. That exposed my glory, my holiness, because previously they were used to seeing when they needed water, Moses struck the rock. Now, with him speaking to the rock, that opens up a whole new panorama of, he just spoke to it this time? How did that happen? And it would have stirred up the curiosity of the children of Israel to perhaps seek God more. And it only leads me to recognize that not only was the children of Israel learning about God and his ways, so was Moses. Moses hadn't arrived. He was in training and being refined just as well. And it mirrors that God was trying to bring Moshe to a higher level of actuation, of dealing with circumstances and situations. He didn't have to use his physical capacities by striking. He said, speak to the rock. And he was teaching Moshe to do what God did. God spoke everything into being. Let there be light. And all 
creation was spoken into existence. Now we all know that everything in the universe is vibrating at varying frequencies. Our voice, the sound of it vibrates. There's power in our voices. It can either be for good or it can be for destruction. And we see that in our own families and how our parents handle the children or don't handle the children. Or how they say things that set person, people on a course of maybe a negative image of who they are as a person. Never thinking they could ever do something or accomplish something or be something. Words are powerful. And I think God was trying to show Moses his glory of creating things with his words. Now, that's really not good if you think you're going to go around and just speak words. And there are people that do speaking things into being. Well, God doesn't will it. And it's born out of your own flesh and desire. Oh, it may shake things up a little bit. But the real McCoy is when God shows you and, and by his spirit tells you to speak to the rock, speak to that situation, things will happen, things will change, things will move. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, corporal but against powers and principalities of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we wrestle with. And God is our defender. He is our covering. He is our protector. Just as when Moshe, as we'll talk about, we won't get to it, but where he went up onto Mount uh, Nebo, and the, the angel Michael and Lucifer, the, the fallen angel, they battled over Lucifer wanted to take Moses' body. And Michael knew that that's not what God sent him there for. Michael did not, you know, use his self-imposed, self-initiated power. <clears throat> He said to, to Lucifer, he said, Yehovah rebuke you. In other words, he stepped back and he turned to Yehovah, Elohim, and he petitioned him briefly. Rebuke Lucifer. So he doesn't take Moses' body. That was for God to decide. But God works through people, through angels. Okay? We don't worship them. We don't bow down to them. But we know they exist. They are messengers. They are messengers of God's word, his will, and his purposes to convey to us and to direct us. We are, we are his tools in his kingdom, in his great architectural creation of his kingdom. That's all I'll say about Moses. <laughs> I don't want to, I, I'm a little long-winded, so I apologize. I want to try and really condense this. And so Adonai was angry with me on account of you, meaning the children of Israel, and he didn't listen to me. Adonai said to me, enough from you. Don't say another word to me about this matter. Climb up to the top of Pisgah, and look out to the west, north, south, and east. Look with your eyes, but you will not go across this yard. However, commission Yehoshua, encourage him and strengthen him, for he will lead this people across and enable them to inherit the land that you will see. So we stayed in the valley across from Beit Peor. And so it said that that Moses, God showed Moses basically the accurate Hayamim, the world to come, 
all the phases of the future of mankind that were going to take place. He would see Israel, even as Israel is right now today, that is a telling amongst the sages that that's what God did. He didn't allow him to go into the land because he disobeyed God's instruction, but God allowed him to see it, and to see what would happen and how God would bring Israel to its fullness and completeness through which he created Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob. And through them, all the nations of the earth were to be blessed. Now let me ask you a question. Would you rather be blessed by the way you want to be blessed? Or by the way the creator who made you knows what is best in the blessing that you need to receive to make you complete and full and full of joy and happiness. Think about it. Do we want our way or do we want God's way? Do we want what God has sanctioned and validated down through time? The scrolls are thousands of years old. None other. There are no others. Oh, there's the Sumerian tablets. But it's been proven that the Sumerian tablets reflect a lot of a pre-civilization that had similar, similar principles and ways in which their society was structured. God was around then. I'm sure he had an influence and he created what was there. Now Israel, Moses is speaking, listen to the laws and rulings I am teaching you. Why? Well, we got to listen. We got to know the laws and rulings are his mitzvot, his ways. Really important to understand. The Bible, the Torah, everything that's in it is a handbook for us to know God's character and his ways and how his kingdom functions. Because his kingdom will and is establishing itself on the earth. Despite all that you see, don't be discouraged. It says, when the evil comes in like a flood, Yehovah will raise up a standard, a wall that will defeat the evil and crush it and destroy it. See, God is assembling all the nations into the valley of Megiddo. That's what's happening. We're seeing all these nations surrounding Israel coming at them. God's drawn the nations into them to judge them. To show that He is the God of the universe. That He is the Creator. That all men, it says that the name of Yeshua... Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's where we're headed, folks. I say we either, either acknowledge that now or in fear and trembling we'll acknowledge it then in the midst of all the chaos and, 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 and terrible times that will come. We are, we are in the end of days, clearly. We are clearly in the end of days. There's not much more prophecy that has to be fulfilled. It's all there. He says, now listen to the laws and rulings I'm teaching you in order to follow them. Well, why, why am I teaching here today? Because I'm trying to share truths and principles and ways so that so you can follow them so that you will live. So God's telling us, if we listen to his laws and rulings and follow them, 
that we will live. If you don't know Yeshua, if you don't know God's ways, you haven't really lived. You may think you have lived. You've lived on a level of physicality, of physical living, with all the ups and downs, the pleasures, the disappointments, the everything that goes with it. But if you want to know what it really means to live, learn of his ways. Then you will go in and take possession of the land that Adonai, the God of your fathers, is giving you in order to obey the mitzvot of Adonai, your God, which I am giving you. A mitzvot is simply, it's an instruction. It's a command. It's a directive. If you work for somebody, they tell you to do something, you could call it a command. Or you could say, my boss just gave me a task where my boss just instructed me to go do something, and you go and do it. Just normal. That's all God's saying. I have some instructions for you. I want, some, I, want, I want you to carry some things out for me. That's why I created you. I want you to serve your neighbor, serve your brother, your sister. He says, do not add to what I'm saying and do not subtract from it. Oh, how that has just proliferated. Has man so added to God's word? Has man so subtracted from God's word as it's passed down and passed down in many different ways? The translations and the, the, the uh, mankind's just there I go again. <laughs> mankind's Imperfection. Our imperfection. Sometimes we don't translate things the right way. But we have an agenda. Do you know that there's translators that translated the Bible? They have an agenda. They're, they're translating scriptures for a particular purpose in order to sell it and make money. And they are reaching out to a market of certain types of people I've heard some, some people that have been involved in that where something was translated. It was pointed out that some things were wrong and they said, we're not changing it now. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? And then people go and they teach from it and they read from it and they believe it. And it sets them off in a different direction of, of really understanding who God is. You know... We need to, as it says in the scripture, search the scriptures, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, a believer, needing not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. This Torah is simply a compilation of all the truths of God. And we have to uncover them. He says, if you seek me, when you seek me, if you seek me with all your heart, then you'll find me. And I'll uncover the mysteries, the truths of who I am. You saw with your own eyes what Adonai did at Baal Peor. That Adonai destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal Peor, which was a place where Balak and Balim who wanted to destroy Israel, but God would not allow them to. He said, you will not curse Israel, you will bless Israel. And they, they couldn't do anything to Israel at that time. Nothing. But Balaam knew how to get at the Israelites. And that was through lust of the flesh, fornication, adultery, and immorality. That's what they gave in to. Not, all, not everybody. But God struck them um, and those, it says, Adonai destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal Peor. That was the place where the Midianites came and tempted the Israelites with that. And some gave in. And there was, just like the, just like the, uh, the, the golden calf, there was lewdness and, and 
just immorality. But you who stuck with Adonai your God are still alive today, every one of you. Look, I have taught you laws and rulings just as Adonai my God ordered me. Why? Why did I teach these to you? So that you can behave accordingly in the land that I'm giving to you. The land I promised to Abraham, Israel. And there's more to that if you study the scriptures. Little Israel today is nothing of what God gave to Abraham and promised him as his inheritance of the land that God would give to the Israelites. It's bigger. Maybe one day we'll be able to share that with you. Like you see where it says right in the Torah, right in the scriptures. And trust me, everybody over there knows that. It's all about money and power and control. But they don't realize that who they're fighting against is not Israel. They're fighting against God and His plan. In Eob, Job, God says, my plans will not be thwarted. In other words, God's planned this all out. He's written it out. It's up to us to choose to cooperate with him, to yield and honor, to freely choose to honor him. Because it's, it's his world, it's not ours. We disobey, we were in sync with him, and we bifurcated, we decided to do our own thing. And we've been forever, for 6,000 years, we've been trying to get back. To obeying him, surrendering, and getting, getting in union with his plan. That's where life is, with his plan, not our plan. We screw things up all the time, let's face it. We're, 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 we're imperfect. We have a sin nature in us, and we have a resurrected nature in us. And those two things battle in our soul in our inner man. We fight that. We struggle with it. But it's part of the journey. Just like Israel, 40 years through the wilderness, they battled, but God refined them. They were sanctified through their troubles. They were made whole. They were made new. So that you can behave accordingly in the land where you are going in order to take possession of it. In other words, i got to give you laws and rulings and teach you how to behave in the land so you can possess it. If you don't act respectably the way I expect of you and that my ways are my kingdom, uh, you're not going to possess the land. You're going to become assimilated into it and become just like all the other people that are there that are caught up in raucous behavior. I mean, the things that were going on in Canaan, Canaan back then, was hideous. It's, it's where the world is going now. We're getting close to that. We really are. Believe it or not, God's not going to have that. He will draw a line in the sand. And there will be consequences for all those who rebel against his values and his principles. People think they're getting away with it now. But when that moment comes where consequence and judgment come, people are going to be running, running to God, asking for forgiveness and reconciling and changing their ways. Therefore, observe them, my ways, follow them, for then all peoples. Notice the benefits of following God's ways. Now bear in mind, polytheism, many gods populated the whole Middle East, where, where, just, where people existed at that time, the center of the world. But this is what God is saying. Observe them and follow them, my ways, for then all peoples will see you as having wisdom and understanding. Would you like people to view you as being wise and being an understanding person? 
I think most people would want that. We would want people to think well of you, good of you, to, to revere you. Wow, she really understands some things that I didn't know how to deal with this problem. I, but she, well, she really understood it. She really helped me. Likewise, likewise. We've, we've had our challenges here, and Jose's been a good brother, and, and I appreciated his wisdom and his understanding. We all need each other in order to get through the struggles of this life. For what great nation is there that has God as close to them as Adonai our God, whenever we call on him? What great nation is there that has laws and rulings as just as this entire Torah which I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves diligently as long as you live, so that you won't forget what you saw with your own eyes, so that these things won't vanish from your hearts. Rather, make them known to your children and grandchildren. The day you stood before Adonai at Mount Sinai, and when Adonai said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will make them hear my very words, so that they will learn to hold me in awe as long as they live on earth, and so that they will teach their children. Do you believe that God appeared? Do you think two and a half million people attesting to it? And a Hebrew nation and Jewish people who are still alive today as a nation and as a people, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith to recognize that they saw the fire come down on the mountain and they heard the voice of God. Those stories were passed down to their children. And their children, I'm sure you've had things that were passed down in your life from your, from your parents. I know I was. Things that I was told about my family. I'm eighth generation here in America. My ancestors came here in 1742. My original ancestor probably knew Daniel Schneck, the originator of Schnecksville. This road went right down to our farm. Did I ever know I would be here in this building, teaching and speaking God's word? No. They will learn to hold me in awe as long as they live on earth and so that they will teach their children. You approached and stood at the foot of the mountain and the mountain blazed with fire to the heart of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick mist. And Adonai spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no shape. There was only a voice. He proclaimed his covenant to you, his pledge, his promise, which he ordered you to obey. Those were the ten words. You call them the ten commandments. He wrote them on two stone tablets. At that time, Adonai ordered me, Moshe, to teach you laws and rulings. Why? So that you would live by them in the land you are entering in in order to take possession of it. Therefore, watch out for yourselves, since you did not see a shape of any kind on the day Adonai spoke to you in Horeb from the fire. Do not become corrupt and make yourselves a carved image having the shape of any figure, not a representation of human being, male or female, or a representation of any animal on earth, or a representation of any bird that flies in the air, or a representation of anything that creeps along on the ground, or a representation of any fish in the water below the shoreline. For the same reason, do not look up at the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything in the sky and be drawn away to worship and serve them. Adonai, your God, has allotted these to all the peoples under the entire sky. No, you, Adonai, have taken and brought out the smelting furnace out of Egypt to be a people of inheritance for him as you are today. 
That's why we say the Shema. The Shema simply says, it's the most important reciting in, in Judaism. Hear, O Israel, Yehovah is our God. Yehovah is one. In other words, that day at Mount Sinai, we understood that we, the mixed multitude, mind you, Hebrews, Jews, and the nations, people that were from many nations. Remember, Egypt was a metropolitan area, like New York City is today, many different peoples. But they that day knew that they were the people of God. God claimed them as His. Just like all the other gods, people declared that this is our God. The Hebrew says, no, Yehovah, the creator of the universe, is our God. There is no other God. El El Yom, which all the nations understood who El El Yom was. El El Yom means in Hebrew, the most high God above all other gods. And that's why God, in even as we'll get to it, he says, I am the Lord your God, and there is none other besides me. There is no other God. They're non-gods. We think they're gods, but they're little g-gods. Poof. God, God will eliminate them in a heartbeat. You see, in Colossians 115 it says, He, Yeshua, is the visible image of the invisible God. He is supreme over all creation. You see, but Adam and I was angry with me on account of you and swore that I would not cross the yard and go into that good land which Adam and I, your God, is giving you to inherit. Rather, I must die in this land and not cross the yard. But you are to cross and take possession of that good land. Watch out for yourselves so that you won't forget the covenant, in other words, the teaching, the ways, the guidelines, the instructions of Adonai, your God, which he made with you, and make yourself a carved image, a representation of any forbidden to you by Adonai, your God. For Adonai, your God, is a consuming fire, a jealous God. So God is in is a consuming fire. Now what did Moses see in, in the wilderness when God revealed himself to him? A burning bush. He saw a bush where it was on fire, but it wasn't burning up. That was God. And he spoke out of it. And he called Moses. Called him to lead his people to be the example, the shadow of the coming Messiah who would lead all people from all nations to receive salvation, deliverance from the disobedience and sinfulness that we inherited through Adam. Now here... Moses begins to prophesy over the nation of Israel. Only 40 years after being in the wilderness, preparing to go over the Jordan into, take over Jericho, he says, when you have had children and grandchildren, he's now talking to the multitude, live a long time in the land, which you're going to cross over to, become corrupt, made a carved image, a representation of something, and thus done what is evil in the sight of Adonai your God, and provoked him. I call on the sky and the earth to witness against you today, that you will quickly disappear from the land that you are crossing the Arden to possess. Did the Israelites disappear from the land? In 70 AD, the Romans kicked them out. And to really tick off all the Jewish people, he changed the name 
of Judea and Samaria, he changed it to Palestinia. It's not Palestinian, it's Judea and Samaria and the Galil. Those are the original names that was given to that land. It's a historical fact. It just is. It's written in the Torah. Look it up. I'll be glad to show anybody. Today, you will quickly disappear from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days there, but will be completely destroyed. Adonai will scatter you among the nations, among the peoples to which Adonai will lead you away. You know, the Jews are all over the world. They're in every country. Because God scattered them. He just scattered them. Because they were disobedient. They were corrupt. And by God disciplining them, and them having to bear the consequence of their disobedience to God. He said, but you're going to wise up while you're away. And I'm going to call you back into the land. I'm going to reassemble you there. Because it's the land I promised to give as an inheritance to Abraham. It's your inheritance from the patriarchs, from your father. God's in control. It's The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's not ours. It's not any one nation's. Actually, Jerusalem belongs to God. And He'll decide. And we will see it. It'll be really amazing. We're, we're, we're right on the cusp. We're going to see a lot of supernatural things starting to take place. Trust me. Adonai will scatter you among the peoples and among the nations to which Adonai will lead you away. You will be left few in number. There you will serve gods which are the product of human hands, made of wood and stone, which you can't see, hear, eat, or smell. However, from there, you will seek Adonai your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and being. And that's what Jeremiah says, the prophet. For here is what Adonai says while they were in exile in Babylon. I will remember you and fulfill my good promise to you by bringing you back to this place, Israel. For I know what plans I have in mind for you, says Adonai. Plans for well-being, not for bad things, so that you can have hope and a future. When you call to me and pray to me, I will listen to you. When you seek me, you will find me. Provided you seek for me wholeheartedly with your heart. We can seek God with our intellect. But it's got to get that 18 inches down to our heart. It's got to be circumcised. Our hearts have to be circumcised. Given to loving and, and recognizing the love of God. It says in the end... Paul says there'll be three things left. Faith, hope, and love. That's the essence of where we're heading. He says, I will listen to you. When you seek me, you will find me, provided you seek for me wholeheartedly. And I will let you find me, says Adonai. Then I will reverse your exile. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've driven you says Adonai, and bring you back to the place from which I exiled you, which was the land of Israel. In your distress, when all these things have come upon you, in the Akaret Hayamin, in the world to come, you will return to Adonai your God and listen to what he says. For Adonai your God is a merciful God. He will not fail you, destroy you, or forget the covenant with your ancestors, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, which he swore to them. Indeed, inquire about the past before you were born, since the day God created human beings on the earth, from one end of heaven to another. Has there ever been anything as wonderful as this? 
Has anyone heard anything like it? Did any other people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of a fire as at Mount Sinai, as you've heard, and stay alive? Or has God ever tried to go and take for himself a nation from the very bowels of another nation, as in Israel and Egypt, by means of ordeals, signs, wonders, war, a mighty hand, an outstretched arm, and great terrors like all that Adonai your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. This was shown to you so that you would know that Adonai is God and there is none other beside him. It's all there. That applies to us. Why do I say that? Because it was a mixed multitude. God was conveying the shadow that his efforts of reconciling mankind and teaching us his ways was not just meant for the Jews. From Adam to Noah, there were no Jews. There were no Hebrews. God offered his Torah, his ways, to all the peoples, but they rejected it. They didn't want it. Then the flood came. But the descendants, during that time, there were righteous men. Enoch, Seth, Noah. And that carries on down. Noah was the grandfather, or great-grandfather, of Avram. So, the Word of God, the Torah, God's ways was being taught, and it survived down to Avraham. And then from Abraham, God's plan of expanding that to place. You see, therefore, since we have, it says in this phrase, and this is from Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, 1227. This is God speaking concerning the end of days. And, and this phrase one more time makes clear that the things shaken the first time God shook the earth with 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 uh, when Yeshua was was put on the torture stake there was an earthquake that's a historical fact are, are you okay my head is fine. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Um, So, our God is a consuming fire. Because he loved your ancestors, he chose their descendants after them and brought you out of Egypt with his presence and great power in order to drive out ahead of you nations greater and stronger than you so that he could bring you in and give you their land as an inheritance. As is the case today, know today and establish it in your heart that Adonai God in heaven above and on earth below, there is no other. Therefore, you are to keep his laws and mitzvot, which I am giving you today, so that it will go well with you and with your children after you, and so that you will prolong your days in the land Adonai your God is giving you forever. Moses is reviewing all this with the nation of Israel just as well to review it with us. It all applies to us. Everything here applies to us. It's just, it's just 2024. It's not 1478 BCE. The same principles apply. The same laws and ordinances apply and in the gospels and epistles we have a whole group of people that say well the Torah was done away with oh we don't need to follow the commandments that's not what I'm reading it even says it in John 15 Yeshua himself says, I have a new commandment for you. 
That word commandment is the same thing as a mitzvah. It's an instruction. No different. So all the instructions that God has given us from the dawn of time still apply. We've got to learn them. We've got to know them. And in Judaism, the way we understand them, and I, I, I don't mean to pick on the church, but they do in some ways, but we, we really have established a solid pathway for, for understanding the 613 mitzvot. And by the way, there's probably another 1,500 mitzvot that were established in the Gospels and Epistles, if you really study it. They're instructions on how to act, how to think, and how to relate to God and to your neighbor. And so in Judaism, we have what's called halakha. It's translated more or less as Jewish law. It, it's the way, basically, halakha is basically the way to behave. That's simple. So as we study the Torah, God teaches us how to behave, how to act. Has the world forgotten how to act? Has all our systems forgotten how to treat their fellow man? Why, we're, 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 we're deluged with lies and deception and fraud. It says that truth is a pillar of, of, of freedom. When you can't trust someone or believe anybody anymore, the news, the, you know, the, the politician, your, your repairman, your auto mechanic, society begins to disintegrate. People don't know who they can trust anymore. That's what the Torah teaches us to be true, to be honest, to speak the truth in love, to teach right, principled ways to, to relate. So Moses is basically reminding them here in this Parsha. And I won't go on any further because I think we got the idea. He, he actually goes over the, the Ten Commandments to remind them. Let's face it, they had a lot of time to burn out there in the wilderness. They, they didn't have to go shopping or anything. They had enough time to, for him to go over everything. So, but... But we need to seek the Lord. And when we do that, he'll, we'll find Him. He'll allow us to find Him when we seek Him. But it's like the athlete. We've got to just keep on, you know, got to keep on going after Him. He's a rewarder. Think of this. Yehovah is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You want a reward from God? Start seeking Him. I hope this gave you a pathway to find Him. Baruch Hashem. Thank you. Amen. Bless you all. I hope this ministered to you, made you think about some things. Those of you who happen to stumble across this on YouTube, I hope it blesses you. We're at Bay Torah here in Schnecksville, PA. We welcome anyone. God loves you. He loves you. He loves us. He loves you. He wants to restore us to the way He intended us to be. takes work. Any relationship takes work. It's just the way it is. Husband and wife have 
have your ups and downs. You just gotta work at it. You gotta reconcile. You gotta forgive. All those elements are here in the Torah, in the Halakha. The way to behave. Shavua Tov, Baruch Hashem. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you. It was I who made you, formed you.